Um, the, the idea I had to put this show together uh, came just from fortuitously noticing that the uh, uh, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus was closing the show this year after 146 years, uh, starting in 1871. And they could no longer uh, make a living doing it. The, the uh, ticket sales were plummeting after uh, they were no longer uh, able to uh, show wild animals and particularly elephants that had really carried the circus on their broad backs for many years. And um, the uh, audiences were dwindling, the costs were rising, and it finally became just uh, a, a losing proposition. So they're doing their last show tonight, same night we're here, in Nassau County, New York, at Nassau Coliseum on Long Island. If anybody here comes from Long Island, that's where the circus is wound up. And it wasn't always Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. It was uh, uh, started out with uh, Barnum and Bailey, or with Barnum, actually P.T. Barnum, the greatest showman uh, on earth. And he joined forces with with Bailey at one point, and then in 1919, and then he had been doing that, you know, since the uh, 19th century. And then in 1919, the uh, Ringling Brothers, the seven brothers, all from the same family, um, also had a, a circus. And they decided they would do better if they stopped competing against each other, but, but joined forces, and that's what they did. And so ever since 1919 now, uh, the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus has been uh, traveling the world, uh, presenting the show that they put on. And P.T. Barnum came up with that great ad line, the greatest show on earth. Uh, so despite the fact that I'm happy to see that the uh, animals are not going to be Wild animals won't be used in in uh, quite that way. Uh, I I can't deny the fact that uh, I grew up uh, enjoying being able to go and see a circus once in a while, and I started thinking about the music that I love that might not exist were it not for this history and the culture of the circus. And once I got through making a list, I thought this is worth presenting in some fashion in the show because these are not just, uh, you know, occasional uh, half-baked songs. These are some of the prize songs. The greatest songs ever written in the 20th century may not have been able to be written had it not been for the language, the metaphors, the symbols, the images, all that come out of the history and the tradition of the circus. So songwriters have always responded to it, even if animal rights activists have kind of been uh, 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 upset by it. So I'll start with one song. And it's not always, you know, it's not that these songs are about the circus. There's one image, one line, one phrase, but you can't replace it with anything else. It is what it is. And if the circus weren't there to have given that line, in this uh, first case to Joni Mitchell, we may never have heard this song. And I thought, my God, that's unbelievable. That's, that's a cultural contribution that transcends uh, anything that we ordinarily think of. So, here we go. Everywhere. 
stately rhythms of the ancient melody. If I had a troubadour, I'd signal with my hand, and he would sing for you. He would sing for you until you smile. Wish I had a castle climb. There's your circus. Tricks and somersaults, you have to laugh at that. If I had a castle clown calling to your side, he'd do tricks for you. He'd do tricks for you until you smile. Wish I Exactly a circus inspired song. So then I thought of taking it out of the set, and then I thought, and this was first thing this morning, I'm going to the Topanga Banjo Fiddle Contest and Folk Festival, and I don't have any other songs that I play on the banjo but this. No way am I going to Topanga without a banjo. So, the song is in the set. Written by Isidore Baleen, great folk songwriter from the old country. His first hit when he came to the U.S. was Marie from sunny Italy. And on the sheet music, he wrote, I, Baleen. And the printer, this didn't happen in Ellis Island where a lot of other names got changed. The printer saw it, I, Baleen and thought, well, I probably short for Irving. So he turned Isidore into Irving. And then he just misread his last name. Instead of reading it as Baleen, he read Berlin. <laughs> so Isidore Baleen became Irving Berlin. And the song sold 100,000 copies in its sheet music form. That was social media in the early 1900s. And so Irving Berlin was suddenly in business. And he said, no way am I changing this name. I've got a, I've got a brand in this. So everything else he wrote was Irving Berlin. That's... This song, you wrote this in 1946 for the show, Annie Get Your Gun, and it became the theme song for show business. So this is a show about the greatest show on earth, and it certainly uh, fits in the general 
big tent of show business. So here's a little bit of what Irving Berlin wrote. And it was a form of a circus before, before circuses kind of got, uh, you know, stabilized. There were different forms that were kind of highlighting different aspects that all kind of got folded into a circus. But at the time that this uh, show was written, he was paying homage to Buffalo Bill and the Wild West show. And when he said there's no business like show business, that's what he was talking about. shortly after the elephants did. And thereby hangs a tale. There was uh, a fellow who wanted to be a lion tamer in the worst way. And he kept his lion taming costume and his whip and boots and everything else, jungle hat and so forth. On mothballs, against the time when maybe if he was lucky the circus would come passing through and they might have a job that he could apply for. So he just kept waiting and biding his time and finally he looked in the one ad section of the local paper and sure enough it was a little box ad. Lion Tamer wanted. He thought now's my chance. He got his lion taming clothes together, his boots, his jungle hat, went down to the big top, walked into the office and said, I'm here to apply for the lion taming job. And the manager said, well, uh, we have a few applicants that are ahead of you if you don't mind waiting. You can come out with us. We're going to start the auditions right now. And so he went out with the ringmaster, and they brought the lion out to the center of the cage. And they started auditioning people who were there to try to win the job of being their official lion tamer. And there were several guys that went through the process they didn't do too well and the ringmaster was clearly not terribly excited by any of them and the guy who had been waiting for years to be able to get this job 
kind of started poking him in the side. He said, when do I get my chance? When do I get my chance? And the ringmaster said, hold on, we got just one more, and then you're going to go up next. And so they opened the door on the far side of the lion cage, and a beautiful woman walked out to the center of the ring. The guy said, I didn't know that you could have women lion tamers. This was, you know, a number of years ago. He says, well, you know, we're, we're, we're having to pay attention to the uh, uh, laws regarding equality in the workplace now. So we, we can't tell anybody they can't apply for the job, but I'm sure she's not going to be terribly skilled. So don't worry, your, your turn is coming up. The lion was sitting in the corner on his haunches, and the woman came out to the center of the ring. She was wearing a fur coat. She undid the sash on the fur coat and let it fall to the floor around her. She wasn't wearing anything underneath that fur coat. The lion got up off of the chair in the corner of the ring and very quietly padded out to the center of the ring. And he stopped in front of that woman and he rose up on his hind legs and he put his forepaws on either shoulder very gently. And then he leaned over to the side and he gave this beautiful woman a peck on the cheek. And then he got off of the shoulders of this woman and he circled around three times in front of her and he lay down on the floor, put his head on his forepaws and went to sleep. The ringmaster turned to the guy who'd come with his bull whip and his boots and everything. He said, well, you think you can do any better than that? And the prospective lion tamer looked at the ringmaster and he said, Mister, you just get rid of that lion in that cage and I'll show you what I can do. <laughs> song was sung shortly after the Civil War. It goes all the way back to 1857. So it's 1867, I'm sorry. So it's 150 years old. It's been in many different versions. The version I got is from Burl Ives because he was the first folk singer that I fell in love with. the songs inspired by the circus. This is probably the oldest and most recognized. It was sung in a movie, I think it was a Billy Wilder movie, on a train with Gary Cooper starring. The whole train of people started singing the song in the chorus. It was a wonderful scene. Once I was happy, now I'm forlorn. Like an old coat that is tattered and torn Left in this wide world to weep and to mourn Betrayed by a maid in her teens The maid that I loved, she was handsome She tried all the fellows to please But I couldn't please her one quarter so well As the man on the flying track Here's the chorus. I want you all to join me. You ready? It floats through the air with the greatest of ease. The daring young man on the flying trapeze. His actions are graceful. All girls he does please. And my love he's stolen away. He plays with a mist like a cat with a mouse. His eyes would undress every girl in the house. Perhaps he is better described as a louse, but still people came just the same. Each 
smile from the bar on the people below. One night he smiled at my love. She blew him a kiss and she shouted, Bravo! As he hung by his nose from above. Everybody comes through the air with the greatest studies. The daring young man on the flying trapeze. His actions are graceful. All girls he does please. Love he's stolen away. I wept and I whimpered, I simpered for weeks while she spent her time with the circus's freaks. Tears big as hailstones flow down my cheeks.
uh, said on the record regarding uh, the Stones' biggest hit, Satisfaction. He said, I could have written Satisfaction. He said, but no way could Mick and Keith have written Tambourine Man. <laughs> And when they asked for a response from Mick, he said, Bob is right. <laughs> because he had diabetes and they told him he couldn't have sodium but he couldn't think of living without hot pepper sauce so he created his own blend and you can get it in various specialty shops it's called Brother Brew Brews African Hot Sauce if anybody wants to sing this song now is the time are you ready?
girls high school, the only Jewish faculty member in the Catholic girls high school. And I used to have wonderful conversations with the sisters on the faculty. Anytime we had a controversial topic or something that touched on anything religious, uh, I would always quote the New Testament to defend my point of view. And then they would get back at me and quote the Old Testament to defend their point of view. And so we kept on kind of making each other familiar with our respective religious traditions and also showing that we had uh, a little mutual respect for each other's faiths. And it was quite a wonderful year I spent there teaching at Lourdes High School in southwest Chicago. It was during that time that I read a story in the Chicago Tribune about a local street, not a street performer, but a local performer called Jack Thumb, the clown. And he entertained children in hospitals, children's hospitals, and birthday parties. And he also uh, had been an orphan growing up in Chicago and had a special feeling in his heart for the life and the struggles of an orphan. Uh, as a result of which, he and his wife adopted 37 homeless children during their time. And the Chicago Tribune story was just the kind of the first glimmer of publicity that this extraordinary human being uh, attracted. It wound up uh, getting the attention of uh, Hollywood. <laughs> and they made a movie called Jack Thumb, starring Mickey Rooney. And it was a wonderful movie, it was a wonderful story. Before the movie was made, however, I weighed in with a song of my own because I was uh, very much inspired by uh, reading about what he did. He kind of inspired me to sing at hospitals and do, do that kind of entertaining when I got back to Los Angeles. So it meant a lot to me. So this song is called, just called Jack Thumb the Clown. And that was his, his name. Jack Thumb was Chicago's clown. He couldn't stand seeing children frown. So he played the children's hospitals for free. When they told him Jack Thumb was coming, you could hear the whole place a hum. The room was always filled to capacity. They didn't need to see the tent. flying trapeze. When they saw Jack Thumb the Clown, they knew the circus had come to town, and they were just as happy as they could be. Jack Thumb was an orphan child, and no one cared if he ever smiled, so he promised to bring some laughter into this troubled world. A funny hat and a big red nose were all he needed to do his shows. He brightened the days of thousands of boys and girls. They didn't need to see the tent, the lion tamer or the elephant. They didn't need the man 
did. He must have gotten up mighty early to find a woman like his wife Shirley. They raised 37 homeless kids. They didn't need to see the tent, the lion tamer, or the elephant. They didn't need the man on the flying trapeze. When they saw Jack Thumb the Clown, they knew the circus had come to town. He made them just as happy as they exactly what he was worth. But to all the children who laughed in the hospital and 37 who cried at the funeral, that poor clown was the greatest show on earth. They didn't need to see the tent, the lion tamer or the elephant. Circus had come to town. He made them just as happy as they could be. They were just as happy as they could be. Thank you. We lost uh, one of the uh, board of directors, mainstays of the festival, Carl Gage, this year. Just a uh, a couple months ago, and um, we have various uh, uh, mementos up in his honor throughout the grounds, and it's an honor to do a show on this stage where we're uh, remembering Carl. Uh, so. I want to thank the festival for inviting me back and thank you all for coming. This song was written by Bob Coltman, uh, oh, early 1970s, maybe, 1973 or 4. Before P.T. Barnum started putting on circuses, uh, he produced some minstrel shows. And out of the minstrel shows came the circuses. Bob Coltman wrote the best song I know about that American institution. And uh, so I'm going to sing Bob's song. And thank you again for coming. Peeling underneath last summer's morning glory vine. Old white hat, stump a cigar, an empty bottle of wine. Lay me down, Caroline, lay me down. Don't want to wake up.
this girl saw. Daddy Bones is dead, I guess. Probably don't know or care. Maybe we'll go to a better place. Before they 